Today is Tuesday, January 22nd, 2019. And the location of the interview is the Veterans Center, Walla Walla, Washington. I am interviewing Tom Rowe, that's R-O-E, a Vietnam veteran. And Tom was born July 24th, 1947. Dixie Ferguson and Vic Phillips, the videographer, are conducting the interview. <clears throat> we represent the Blue Mountain chapter of the American Red Cross. So Tom, uh, would you tell the war and branch of service that you served under? The war was the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. and I was an aviator in the U.S. Army. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, uh, and what was your rank when you left the service? Lieutenant Colonel. And where did you serve? I guess you answered that. <laughs> uh, in Vietnam. Uh -huh. um, I went directly to Two Corps and, and stayed with the 92nd Assault Helicopter Company um, for my entire tour. They were stationed in uh, Lane Army Airport and then uh, our AO, our Area of Operations, was Pleiku Lane and Northern Two Corps. We never got into I Corps where you were, right. but we were, we were south of, of that stuff. But we're still in the mountains. The south end of our AO was was rice paddies, but we were basically in the southern end of the mountains. And AO means area of operations. Right. Did you serve any time in Europe? Well, um, when I got back, I uh, was out. Mm, aviators at that time did not have a, a branch. We were a other branches of the art service and special detailed to aviation. So I was an armor officer, so um, that was my home. That's where my promotions would come from. Um, and if the Army needed aviators, they would reach out and grab them from the different services. Mm -hmm. So when I got back, I went straight to, um, to Kansas and the Big Red One, mm -hmm. um, the 1st Infantry Division. Um, they happened to deploy at one point for a, a reforger mission. Um, which I don't know if they're going on or not, but that was part of the after World War II. They'd pick up a division, send it over, march them across southern Germany to Grafenwehr, do tank gunnery, and send them home. Uh -huh. So I did that. Okay. So I guess I was deployed to Europe for about six weeks. Okay. We'll get into <coughs> a little bit of that yeah, later on in the yeah. interview. Great. Got, to see, got to see nothing except the, the roadsides and mud holes and ditches <laughs> and, and maintenance yards and a force march across doing a war war games across southern Germany the Germans got tired of that uh, and uh, they didn't want to feel occupied so they asked us to quit I think a couple a decade ago or so okay very good yeah we'll touch on that again uh, later on in the, in in sure. the interview uh -huh. and uh, were you drafted or did you enlist well um, there I was minding my own darn business and I flunked out of advanced um, well, didn't fl I had to leave. I, I got, they let me out of advanced calculus. At that point, I was not making normal progress, and the draft board sent me a note saying that we see you're not making normal progress. Should there be any reason why you shouldn't be? So I went to the ROTC department. ROTC. ROTC. ROTC uh -huh. Reser yeah. Reserve Officer Training uh -huh. Corps. And they give you four more years to, to go. As it turned out, my draft number was 27. That year they took over up through number 100. So I was going one way or the other, so I got an ROTC. Uh -huh. Okay, and by the way, where, where were you born and raised? Uh, I was born in Dixon, Illinois, uh, in grade school, went to um, in Chicago, and then I finished off high school and the eighth grade at, at uh, Spokane, Washington. And then I went to college at Eastern Washington State College. Then it was when I applied, it was Eastern Washington State College of Education. This is how old I am. <laughs> then they changed their name to Eastern Washington State College. When I got back from Vietnam, they were Eastern Washington University. <laughs> Same okay. school. Okay, that's Same where school. I went. <laughs> <laughs> and you also were raised in President Reagan's hometown. Uh, yeah, yeah. You were born there. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, Dick. So was I, but we my, we left when I was an infant. Uh huh. Yeah. All right. Very good. So uh, then. Right out of high school, you were off to the army then. No, off to. Oh, I'm sorry. You went to ROTC. I'm ROTC. Sorry. I yeah. apologize. So I graduated from Eastern. You Eastern. Said that. Yeah. And in with a degree in psych and went into the army. Right. Um, officers basic 
um, because I was an armor officer at Fort Knox, Kentucky, and then on to flight school. Okay, okay, and uh, what was the beginning of your military training like? Uh, yeah, that was basic training. ROTC or, or as an officer? As an officer. Well, what, first of all, you went to Fort Knox, you said? Yes, I was commissioned and went to Fort Knox. Okay, uh, well, let's go back to ROTC. What sure. was that like? Your training in ROTC? Um, a couple steps up from the Boy Scouts, <laughs> actually. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I was an outdoor guy, so being out in the middle of nowhere and shooting a gun was just fun. Um, and uh, the instructors were pretty good, um, and you learn a, a lot of interesting things. Um, during that time, the instructors were all Vietnam vets, so they came back with uh, horror stories, war stories, whatever stories. Some of them were pretty affected by it, so most of us blinked and look at these guys and go, hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you, okay, what year would that have been approximately that you were in this ROTC training? Um, 67 to 69. Okay, so you're in the thick, you know the Vietnam War is hot and heavy. Right, that's why they almost drafted me. Yeah. It was hot and heavy. Yeah, and uh, so I'm assuming even in ROTC, you knew the direction you were going. Uh, th that is going. I, I was going into that. active duty. I didn't know that the, I, I would be assigned uh -huh. armor, but I knew I was going in to be but a I lieutenant. Mean, as far as Vietnam, you you knew that was a direction. Yeah, that was pretty go. much a given. We were all going to go. <laughs> right. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, listening to their stories and everything, uh, did that? Uh, how did that what? affect you listening to the Vietnam vet stories? Um, I'm a little different than most. I guess I read a lot, and one of the books we were not supposed to read was the streets without joy and it was about the uh, French Indochina war in Vietnam at the time and how they they blew it and we were blowing it um, those people had been through wars for 2,000 years they were going to be on wars after I was dead uh, we were going to go down there mess around kill a bunch of them they kill a bunch of us and then we'd leave we all knew that all the all the lieutenants knew that um, really Really, so going in, really. Huh? If you could huh? think, huh? otherwise you were just gung ho and popped up and wanted to go grab a gun and run off to Vietnam huh? because you know that's what you're supposed to do as lieutenant. Most of us that could think knew better, but the war was on and we were going to go one way or another, so we all wanted to go as a lieutenant. So we went as sure. a lieutenant. Well, mm -hmm. just on a side question about that, mm -hmm. so you had some obviously very preconceived ideas about the war, so. Did that kind of flavor your attitude then about going over? Um, probably like today, there is a big difference between the lieutenants at the time and the senior officers. Most of the senior officers were gung-ho and wanted to, to get involved and do the right thing. Most of the lieutenants were going, it's a job, I'm going to do as best I can and then I'm going to come home. Were you at all, opti and I'm getting a little bit ahead of the game, but are, were you at all optimistic that maybe we can make a difference there? Me? No. Mm -hmm. you, Nobody you, had. Uh, yeah. And you didn't think Americans' <laughs> presence could possibly uh, uh, create a change in direction um, against communism? You, you just, in other words, We're I don't want to put words into your mouth, but you just thought I'm it was not a, I'm not aware of, of the South Vietnamese or the Americans mm -hmm. willing to strap things on them and blow themselves up. Mm -hmm. um, suicide missions, impossible missions. Mm -hmm. We didn't do that. They did. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why did they do that? Mm -hmm. They did that because it was their country. It's not ours. Mm -hmm. And, it, and in fact, it was all one country, and then at World War II, we divided it up and said, oh, there's a North and a South. Okay, mm -hmm. that hadn't worked for a couple thousand years. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of us were not, you're getting into a lot of political stuff yeah. with me, yeah. but most of us were not, were not convinced that this was, you know, so. Uh, well, that's very interesting. On a, pers on a personal note, mm -hmm. I think it was practice. The U.S. needed practice. We'd been without a war for a while. We had a bunch of material and a bunch of untrained people. So we went down there and practiced practice war. Yeah. Okay, mm. so you're you're through ROTC, then you go to Fort Knox, and how long were you there? Fort Knox? 
what would you say that you went next after your uh, ROTC? ROTC that I, I, I graduated, was commissioned, right. and went off into the Army. Okay, but uh, there was a place before aviation school. Mm -hmm. Didn't you name, it doesn't matter. I, I thought you named another location for more further training uh, before you went into aviation. Well, you asked me when I started my military training, and I don't know where you want me to start. Well, oh, no, okay. Probably in ROTC when I started that. Yeah. <laughs> well, though, I was, because you did this in college, your ROTC. Right. But after, right after college in ROTC, then what was your next move? Fort Knox, Kentucky, That's and, what I was and officer, you. officer's basic. That's what I was asking, Fort right. Knox. Yeah. So I just wanted to know what, how long and what, what were you doing there? Um, you don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, all the people, uh, it was basic training for officers. Right, but this so is for the interview for people who don't know about. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, uh, this well, is for the average. They, 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 uh, <laughs> they, they, a bunch of bunch of new lieutenants show up, and welcome to the army. This is a tank, <laughs> you know, and you learn all about the maintenance on a tank and the tactics of a tank, shooting a tank, um, and a lot of those sorts of things. It's only six weeks long, six weeks, uh -huh. six, eight weeks long, something like that. It was not very long. Right. Um, and then um, from there, most lieutenants who who didn't have a special assignment, like like me, I had a, I, th I was going to be an aviator. Um, went those people went to a tank unit somewhere, and were lieutenants and a, a, a platoon leader in a tank somewhere. Okay, you said you knew you were going to aviation. Yes. You're going to okay, when when did you realize that you were going to uh, aviation? On your senior year of ROTC. Um, <laughs> I sound so pessimistic for a guy who's a career military guy. <laughs> um, th th you, uh, you're sitting there as a young man, and that, pardon me, that damn war is, keeps going on. What are you going to do? Well, I don't want to go to Vietnam and slog around on the ground, so a friend of mine talked me into applying for flight school, because um, he was. And flight school um, was another year after after basic tra after officer's basic another year and then off you would go to to Vietnam uh, I think you had a six month duty uh, anyway um, on stateside so it was going to stand at another 18 months or maybe two years oh that war's got to be over so I applied for flight school I had no intention of ever being an aviator but it was a way to not go kick around on the ground yeah. in Vietnam yeah mm. and uh, so aviation training was where. Um, so after after Fort Knox, uh, I was sent to Fort Walters, Texas, which is about 40, 50 miles due west of San of um, Fort Worth, um, and uh, it's kind of unique town. It's got a little uh, a little um, lake near it called Possum Kingdom Lake, <laughs> and so I mean it's this is rural Texas basically, yeah. <laughs> and. Um, there we were uh, with my wife uh, living in, I was living in a, in a trailer, in a trailer park, and uh, you learn how to fly right from the beginning. In ROTC, because I um, signed up for it, um, I was granted the ability to become a private pilot. So I already had a private pilot's license when I went. Mm -hmm. So that helped me a lot yeah. in flight school. Absolutely. Because um, I understood most of those things they were talking about. Yeah. But uh, it's pretty intense training. I, I will say flight school, um, month for month, was probably harder than, than undergraduate work or graduate work. Wow. In, in flight, it, because it, they, they made you do things and you had to, you had to know it, uh -huh. or they threw you out. Kind of like a, a, pardon the pun, but a crash course. <laughs> 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 well, nine months is not a crash course. You, you learn a lot. When you get out, you are an aviator. Okay, so Fort Walters was nine months. No, Fort Walters was four months, and then from there, um, back at that time, we were transferred to um, Alabama. Fort Rucker, Alabama is the home of Army Aviation, mm -hmm. and you, you, the second phase was there. They threw out people who couldn't get it there, and they threw out people. You, to be an aviator, you have to be able to think and do. Some people can fly really well, but can't pass the court. And some people can are just geniuses at this, but they can hardly tie their shoes and they can't fly. Mm -hmm. In the it, between the two places, they threw people out. So we lost about forty percent, probably, of the people that started. And I'm not surprised. And 
Who was the youngest that you can remember that was in training with you? The youngest? Yeah, they were pretty, some of them were pretty young. They were all about the same or same age. Like 19, weren't there 19, 20 year olds coming through? With me? Uh -huh. No. Okay. Uh, we were officers and to be an officer. I was talking about warrant officers, yeah. And warrant officers didn't go through, through with us. They went through their own, own flight school. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So you mentioned being married. Had, were you married in college or? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I met her in, in Russian class, which I, I dropped out of. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we got married in, um, at, right after, um, right after, uh, well, just just before graduation. Uh -huh. Just before graduation. Yeah, and obviously, I'll, I'll, and and this coming September, I'll have been married to her 50 years. All right. Yeah. Oh, can yeah. you, oh, that's fabulous. Yeah. It's all her fault. <laughs> <laughs> so. She hung in there. Yeah. Uh, as a young uh, military wife, uh, she probably could see out there on the horizon what was going to happen. Yeah. And she obviously uh, was going to be okay with that. She yeah. Well, like most. Most of us, not all of us, but most of us uh, forego having children until we got back mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. yeah. And she obviously was very willing to yeah. be a military wife to stay with me. Went. I don't deserve her. She stayed, yeah, she stayed with me. Says a lot. Mm -hmm. It does. Well, anyway, so okay, now you're at Fort Rucker, mm -hmm. and uh, was that even more intense than Fort Walters? Yes, it's more technical. Bigger, bigger airplanes or bigger helicopters, instrument stuff. So um, I ended up uh, with a, a commercial helicopter license and a commercial instrument license, too, because I took the time and effort to go take the tests and stuff. Okay. But uh -huh. but the flying is pretty intense. Uh -huh. you know. uh, a typical was there a typical day at Fort Rucker? You get up and how many hours of flying a day, or was it flying every day? Um, it depended what phase of the schooling you were in. Um, you, you usually showed up for work at 8 o'clock, 7.30, and you were off by 4.30 or so. Um, sometimes um, that shifted into night hours. Uh, you'd show up at 3 in the, at night and get off at midnight because you needed to get night time, mm -hmm. and not flying at night's different. Mm -hmm. um, sure. So um, lots of, of book work, lots of instruction work. Mm -hmm. um, um, they have, um, um, I can't remember the name of them, but they're, they're trainers. They use, it, it, it looks like the inside of a, of a, of like a, a simulator. It's a simulator, uh -huh. but it's uh -huh. a helicopter simulator. Uh -huh. And you spend a lot of time in those practicing instrument approaches and cross countries and landings and um, stuff so that, mm -hmm. so it's not so foreign when you get up there. Mm -hmm. I, I'm curious because I know it can be very hot. Well, both in Texas and oh, it, Alabama. Yeah, yeah, isn't that interesting? I, um, the the slot I took, I can't remember quite when, but it was early fall oh. when I showed up in Texas, and then it was late spring when I got out of of training. So I missed the middle of the summer in both places. Yeah. How about winter weather? Pretty mild. We're done. Uh, both places. Um, uh, winter weather. Um. In the dead of winter, I was already at Fort Rucker, uh -huh. and uh, it got it, the temperatures were freezing yeah. in northern in northern um, Florida, mm -hmm. and they everybody went home. You mean so Alabama, uh, yeah, Alabama, uh -huh. but but we were just above Florida, gotcha. just, uh -huh. just this bar above Florida. Right. <laughs> so uh, uh -huh. we uh, we got the, uh, between Christmas and New Year's, we got some time off free. But you didn't. We didn't have to pay for it, by our, and so I we we just went and saw Florida. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, were you, for want of a better word, were you enjoying your training all the way through aviation training? Uh, yeah, it's a really intense stuff, and uh, by the time you got into flight school, um, they they were all Vietnam vets too, and they were excited about flying. Flying is very beautiful. It's very technical, um, very interesting, and it consumes you. Your, 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 and I, I like that. I mm -hmm. like being totally involved in what I'm doing. Sure. Okay. Um, can you describe different? Were there different types of helicopters uh, models that you were? Um. Yeah. I, on? I started off on on a TH um, 55A, 
and we call it the Mattel Messerschmitt. <laughs> you probably have seen them around. It's a bubble with a little stick out the back and a rotor, and the bubble holds two people. Um, and I got assigned to it because I was one of the lighter guys at the time, um, and it w it, the instructors tended to be smaller too in those because they couldn't lift very much. <laughs> and so we fly around, mm -hmm. fly around Texas practicing takeoffs and landings when you finally could hover. Mm -hmm. you know, when, you, when they first take you out in a helicopter and they tell you to hover, um, a football field isn't big enough. You can't hardly do it. Uh, by the time I got out of Vietnam, I think I could do surgery with a skid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could do anything in the wind. It was just, you just learned that skill. Were there any incidences uh, of, of potential accidents, anything, during your training time, nine months training? Um, with with my guys, no. All went pretty smooth. Or me? Uh-huh. Um, no. Um, I was one of the better pilots, and, and my, my instructor was anxious for me to go out and solo first, because he had the first guy to solo. So I went out in my Battelle Mesher Spit to solo fly my first time in a helicopter, and I couldn't get the, the metal pedal to move, and I went like this, and I put a hole in the, in the front of the, the plexiglass. <laughs> so I couldn't fly that airplane. Pissed, pissed my instructor off, and he made me almost last. I, I had to buy him two bottles of gin <laughs> just, just to make up to him. <laughs> well, uh, what, what, what was your solo, first solo flight like? That doesn't make sense. I'm sorry. It was, a f uh, I flew. Well, I'm mm -hmm. just asking your, your solo flight. You had a solo flight. Yeah, yeah. yeah so you go out. Um, what was it like? Um, oh, I'll tell you what it was. Um, you, you take off. And you're supposed to go around the pattern three times with land. Okay, <laughs> so I went, flew up, flew a, a specific diagnostic fl flight plan around the uh, the uh, the airport, and then landed. Uh -huh. That was it. And that mean, yeah. just just so you do it, you know. Yeah. But so, um, if it was exciting or whatever, um, of course, you start flunking out of flight school especially, and maybe the Army at the time, uh, if you start getting over-emotional about things, um, they want you to be cool, calm, collected, foresight, think ahead, do your job, or you're going to get killed, or you'll kill yourself, and that's true. So by the time you're flying, or, or even in Vietnam, by the time you're flying, all of us, the Air Force guys are like that too. Um, and you get shot at, and you get practice, and you practice, and you practice. Um, it's just a job. Um, and you get you get emotional later in the officers' club when you're drinking, mm -hmm. but there's no time to get emotional when you're out there doing it. Right. You got to get it done. Were and so we all become we all so we all become little machines, right. little flying machines. They were telling you all this uh, in training then. Yeah, pra yeah. practicing. Yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, uh -huh. for instance, in, 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 in when you take your in, uh, instrument training, right? The, 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 my instructor carried a huge screwdriver. It was this big. If you remember, they have a big handle on it and a screwdriver. And he stuck it in, in his side pocket. And if you did something wrong, he'd pull it out by the, by the, by the <laughs> shank and whap your helmet with it, <laughs> you know, just to get your attention. Wake up. You're looking, you know, he's an a, a, a warrant officer. I outrank him like crazy. but. He's my instructor, and yeah. probably <laughs> years-wise, he had a lot of experience. He did. Most of my instructors have been a couple tours in Vietnam, sure. uh, and lucky to be home. Okay, you knew uh, you knew that you're going to be flying different types of helicopters over there. Only the stuff know? that they issued us. They, uh -huh. the, I, um, the, um, remember the, mo the the movie Mash? Mm -hmm. That helicopter comes in and out. That's what we took basic instrument flying in. Okay, so I went from the Mattel Messerschmitt, the THA-5, to that, that one. And then when we got to Fort Rucker, we started in the Huey system. Now, today, th there was UH-1A, underpowered little piece of crap. Uh, it only lasted a while. I think they lost a bunch of the Vietnam, but then they went to the B model. And the B model was quickly replaced by the C model. And the C model became a gunship at that time for for aviation. Um, they had Cobras, but they were very... Were they the weren't Cobras there when you were there? Yeah, uh -huh. but there weren't very many. Mm -hmm. Most of them were the C-model gunships. 
they were um, improved mass, improved uh, rotor systems, and um, bigger transmission, bigger engines, and they mounted. So often you saw those in Vietnam. That's mostly what you saw in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, ABC, and then the D model. Well, by the time I got to Vietnam, most of the A's and B's have been shot out of the air and reprocessed or whatever they do, and we were in D models. Mm -hmm. And uh, they improved the D models a couple times too. They were much, they were a bit bigger and much more powerful. Mm -hmm. So I went through all of those, oh. all th th those series. Mm -hmm. And then when you get back to the States, you, they don't want to issue, those are two, two guys have to fly those. And so to fly solo and keep up my hours, they transferred me to a jet ranger, a Bell Jet Ranger. So I flew Bell Jet Rangers also. Okay, great. Okay, so it's time to go, time to go to Vietnam. Yes. And... Uh, on Friday the 13th. Yes, Friday the 13th. And I arrived <laughs> at 3 o'clock in the morning on Friday the 13th. Oh I got my. two of those suckers. Oh my. <laughs> uh, that, uh, that had to be a very difficult goodbye uh, as you're uh, boarding, what, a commercial flight over, a, con a, a military flight over to Vietnam? Um, they contracted with, with um, they were contract flights. Mm -hmm. All they did were Vietnam stuff. Right. So I don't remember the air airline, but it was one of the popular airlines and they, they had a, a fleet of, of just feeding people back and forth to Vietnam. Okay, and uh, so you're winging your way over, and you arrived into where in Vietnam? Um, <laughs> I'm 72. I have some medical issues, and I'm trying to remember all the details of things you're doing that great. long ago you're doing great. that don't particularly <laughs> matter. Um, well, it was the, 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 the main airport in, Tonsonu. in Saigon, Tonsonu. 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 Okay, do you remember... As you're landing and you're looking out the window, do you remember your emotions or thoughts when you landed that day? I don't know what most guys t tell you, but mine was just, let's get it on. This terrible long flight, I got to pee, I want to go to sleep in a bed, not this terrible, I want something to eat, um, and let's just keep moving mm -hmm. and just get off of this airplane. So the reminder of Vietnam, mm -hmm. this is a great story. and. We're held on, held on the tarmac. We get off this plane. <laughs> you know what I'm As in pops a spiffy, starched up Vietnamese officer and a, a couple guys with him and give us a talk and he, he chastised us. He didn't want us bringing weapons or drugs into Vietnam. <laughs> and all of us started laughing and the senior officers made a stop. <laughs> so, right, we're going to bring drugs into Vietnam, right. <laughs> But that, he had to come in and he told us that. Oh. No weapons or drugs. Oh my gosh. L later on, I found out that a whole bunch of my friends had pistols and shotguns sent to them or brought them over. They brought them over with, with a buckshot and stuff as their personal weapons. Yeah. You weren't supposed to do that. <laughs> and it's how'd war. they get there? Well, they came in on those airplanes. Yeah. <laughs> so. right. It's war. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you, uh, when you got there, you had some time of orientation in the... Or did orientation? You no orientation. Yeah. They just yeah. put you in a bunk and uh, you wait for your assignment. I was at Tonsonut maybe three days. Hot, yeah. really hot. Um, they issued us um, our, our uh, jungle fatigues. Um, um, you've heard of those before? They issued us our jungle fatigues and pointed us at a mama son down the road that would um, put all of the right places, things in the right places. So I got my four sets. And um, my two sets of boots, I can't remember other stuff, and they, so you could put yourself together. Yeah. As an officer, we paid for it. So we put everything together, and, and then uh, about day four or so, they sent us off to our um, particular, uh, particular thing. And I ended up in the 92nd Assault Helicopter Company, AHC. And uh, was that, play, where was that, Pleiku, or where was that, 92nd? Um, well, um, you know where Cameron Bay yep. is? Mm -hmm. If you look north across Cam across the bay, mm -hmm. there's a little isthmus out there. That was us. Okay. That was our home home, okay. home bay. When you say home base now, I know you said earlier, but was that where you stayed most of the time and you went out from there? Right. Um, uh, we had... Um, 
detachments at Dong Batin, which is about, uh, you'd have to know Vietnam, and these people won't, but if you draw a line from Cameron Bay to Pleiku, um, part of it goes through the um, uh, Mangyang Pass, the, where the Lost Battalion, where the French Lost Battalion was, you familiar with that? I, that one I haven't heard of. I, you're going to have to do some Googling. This is the, <laughs> the, yeah. the, the French, in the French Indochina War, in their great wisdom, um, had a battalion that um, went wandering out in the mountains looking for um, the, uh, the Vietnamese at the time and uh, fought badly, made bad mistakes, um, got overrun, and they killed everybody. Mm -hmm. And they took, took the officers and uh, buried them upside down on that pass facing away from France as a you know, head first in the ground as, as, a, as a way of, 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 of letting the world know that these people are idiots. They shouldn't have done this. No. True. <laughs> <laughs> True. So anyway. Uh, um, and how so many were there of you that went over to Cameron Bay area? How many altogether? I have no idea. But in the assault helicopter company? Yeah. Well, um, there, uh, f units were overfilled at the time, mm -hmm. and so there were probably officers. Is all I know of, I think there were in excess of sixty of us, Ooh, sixty pi good. pilots, yeah. and um, we only had maybe more. Uh, we were full, yeah. <laughs> so, and then the enlisted guys, you know, the the gunners and the maintenance guys and the and the crew chiefs, um, and the the operations people and the cooks and all that, I don't know, a lot. It was a big base with its own large officers club that was full all the time, so. Were you replacements then? Obviously you were replacements then in that area, your group? Vietnam was a war of replacements. Yeah, right. Nobody went for the war like World War II right. or Korea. Um, you had a year mm -hmm. and so right. everybody was coming and going. You right. really got, if you got to know somebody, it was kind of nice and yes. I got to know a couple guys, mm -hmm. but we, yeah. Okay, so you're there, and uh, one of your first assignments, now you're in a war zone, so can you remember some of your first days going out? Yeah, you're outside? petrified, of course. You're actually, and you're, you're called a Peter pilot, and you sit on the right side, the, the aircraft commander sits on the left, and uh, I assigned uh, about three of the more senior pilots. I flew with them most of the time. Um, they seemed to like me. Uh, I liked them, and uh, I was a good pilot, mm -hmm. and uh, they taught me interesting things that you don't learn in flight school that, you, that you, it's impossible, mm -hmm. like, um, well, it's just, there's a bunch of stories. I don't want to take up your time <laughs> with a whole bunch of stories. No, no, I mean, this mm -hmm. is all part of the story. <laughs> oh. Um, when you're, when you're, I'm, I'm going to use your microphone here. Can you, can you see this microphone? Vic. Oh. Okay, if that's a, that's a mountain top, if that's a mountain top, uh -huh. you and you lose your if you lose your 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 engine, you and you you free fall and you can do this and you do this and land. Okay, uh -huh. okay, uh, we're all good at that. But if you're getting shot at a lot and there's guys down here, and the sky gets full of stuff, you can't do that. You have to run like a bat out of hell at the base of that thing, pull up with full power, go like this, and land like that on top of the. I mean, that is so dangerous that they won't do it in the United States, but those pilots could do it, I can do it, but I'll tell you what, it's, mm -hmm. that's one of the things I remember from my first couple of days is yeah. how to do that. And your mission was carrying troops I, mainly? Uh, yeah, uh -huh. combat missions, uh, assaults, uh, extractions, and, and uh, ash and trash is what we call it. That's a, and you carry. Yeah, what does that mean? You, you carry their replacements in and out to forward bases. You carry ammunition in and out. You carry the dead bodies out. You put their feeling on. You know, you, you just whatever, whatever needs to be hauled back and forth in an in, air aircraft. This is going to be a sensitive question. Sure. And I remember from my own experience, uh, bringing the wounded and the dead back to yeah. this camp. Deep. I don't know how, is there any way, or are you willing to describe your emotional experience in doing that? Well, you're a young man, mm -hmm. and uh, they start loading these black bags with a zipper on it inside, and the, black, the bags look like they're full of water because they're 
they're kind of gush gushing back and forth. Well, that's decomposing people in there. <laughs> um, thank God we, we didn't, uh, no, didn't take any rounds, didn't open one and get all the smells and all the stuff. But, you know, you, you see them loading those bags. And at one point, I think we had four or five behind us. Um, and they're just, we, do you, do you, know, you, you just, just you just do it. You just do it. Uh -huh. Oh, sure. Just, you know, separate yourself from it. Sure. Getting your job done. Remember, I, I think I said a little, bef maybe before the interv interview, if you couldn't do that, you couldn't take it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you couldn't fly. Mm -hmm. And if you couldn't fly, mm -hmm. lots of guys dropped out and said, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so they, you know, I, I got shot down three times. Three times. Uh, three times. Um, technical shot downs. <laughs> I'll go what into them if you want, yeah, but no, but, I uh, what but, that means. but well, <laughs> uh, aviators had about a had a nine percent, ten percent death rate, something like that, maybe a little more um, in Vietnam, and so you um, you prepared for these things all the time. So at one point, uh, wh which one do you want? The, what I thought with the dead bodies or the oh well, mm -hmm. no, you were de you did describe that, but sure, you, but you were talking also about being shot down three sure, times. Sure, yeah. You know, I mean, can you give an example of one of them? Or all three? Sure. Um, all three. <laughs> um, um, two of them are more interesting. Mm -hmm. um, um, flying around, minding my own damn business at 3,000 feet or more, um, which is 1,000 feet more than they want you to fly so you don't get hit by guns. Some NVA down there must have been bored like we were bored at times. And it's sitting there, there goes a helicopter. So he gets out a machine gun and starts, just for the hell of it, starts shooting at us. One of those bullets hit us. Oh. I've got six Americans on board, Ash and Trash, remember? Mm -hmm. I've got six Americans at this point on board, and, uh, two, and my two, two guys behind me, and me and my uh, pilot. I was an AC at the time. And there we are, <laughs> flying around, mounting our own business, just going back and forth. And it starts running a little rough. Mm -hmm. uh, is that water in the gas? Uh, is the air is the compressor system screwing up? Did something get in there? And then we look down, and our um, our fuel pressure it fuel pressure is is starting to get low. Mm. What's that? You know, we're talking about that over, and then one of the guys in the back, one of the crew chief, replied, said, "Sir, we've got a lot of water back here." I, I don't know why he called it water. He knew better. Mm. And I said, "Water." And both of us looked at each other. It's not water. It's gas. Yes. It's avgas. It had gone through and severed a line. Okay. Think about this. There are now six, seven, eight, nine, ten of us on that board, on that helicopter, yeah. and none of us are smoking. And 3,000 feet. At 3,000 feet, and the cabinet has got this much avgas in the back because you sit like this and it's in the back. So. If one of us were smoking, we'd have blown up and it had been a hell of a pretty explosion. It would have been wonderful to watch but not be in. Um, so none of us were smoking. So we, uh, I, I uh, ordered them to open the doors to let the gas out. They let open the doors. They were probably overexcited and the door came off the hinge and flew out. Now, oh my what are the chances of it not hitting that rotor blade? It must have twisted and turned and gone down. And okay, so well, there we are. And um, I said, I look around, and we're flying along the coast. And he said, this is great. There's a big sandy beach here. <laughs> hey, you guys. I said, anybody back there in, on the ground? I said, I am. What rank are you? Sergeant. Sarge. <laughs> said, when we hit the ground, you take everybody, including my crew chief. We got two M60 machine guns. We got thousands and thousands and thousands of rounds of ammunition on this thing. You armed? Yes. I said, then you guys are armed. We all got a sidearm. You figure out, put a, a perimeter around us or wherever you want. And we're uh, and when we hit the ground, we're going to be ready. Uh, call call in and say we okay, we got shot down. And said, oh, really? Where are you? Said, oh, we'll, go, we'll send people out. Okay, all right. You know. So and but then it, but, but it's, wait, a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. It's it's just <laughs> training. It's just training. So we did all that. You do all the things you're supposed to do. You go down. You still got a little power. So you r come down. But that's my question. Land. How are you going down? How's that feeling of going down? Normal. I mean, I practiced it a million times. But I'm, I'm asking, is it a, f uh, a free fall or a slow fall? Or um, you, if you've never been in a helicopter in an auto rotation, and I have. <laughs> oh, then, then you know. Yeah. But I'm saying for the audience. <laughs> oh. Um, it starts off with your, so, but once you're falling, you're off, you're falling at a, at a 
considerable rate, but it, if there's no feeling of falling. You can watch yourself fall. Mm -hmm. You know, if things are coming closer and stuff, and you just practice. And then I got over over the the. Uh, you can still fly, but you're flying like you're flying like this. You're not flying like that. So I can, you can move move around on your way down. And we did moved our way on on the way down. I got moved over where we're supposed to be. Landed on the beach. And uh, what kind of a landing was it? It's very soft. I'm good. It was sand too. I mean, it was not hard. It was, was just sand. Do you remember anybody yelling like, "No, officer, sir, sir"? No. no. <laughs> well, you've talked. To, you've talked to a lot of, of, of veterans. We all trust each other. Yeah. They knew we knew what we were doing. Yeah. I had a sergeant back there who knew what he was doing, yeah. Um, yeah. and so we hit the ground. And then um, I'm in charge because I'm, I'm, I'm the ranking person there. I told the sergeant what to do, and I had my co-pilot, my other guy, um, start looking. We got we had some hand grenades, and um, start said when I tell you if we start getting taking fire, you pull all of the radios and blow them up. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things you did, and so we were all ready for that, all set up, and then the cavalry showed up. Okay, cavalry showed up, whole bunch of gunships, and, and then we <laughs> jumped on, and then we all left, and the shoot comes over and picks it up and takes it away. Okay. <laughs> but that made it so it's anticlimactic. But I got shot down. Was the enemy down. around? What? Was the enemy around? We didn't take any fire. Who knows uh -huh. where they were? I mean, it's a big country, so yeah. th we would have been pretty unlucky to land on on somebody. Mm -hmm. But they probably knew we were there. So if we were there overnight, they'd have showed up. But they didn't have time to get there. Can you imagine that NVA? Say, oh my! Hell, what did you say to his buddy? <laughs> Look at that! You know, they, they probably hey, pass me a beer. Who knows? You know, they're what just like shot. they're just like us. <laughs> <laughs> what a shot! Oh, that's incredible. <laughs> Do you mind sharing? So anyway, you're all picked up, and the good news is sure. you got the heck out of there. Sure. And uh, was that uh, up by, by Quinon area? Kind yes. Mid coast Quinon yeah. area. By that area, yeah. Okay. And uh, do you mind sharing another incident like that? Sure. Um, we're flying, flying around, minding our own damn business on a, on a mission this time. And um, as we took off um, and hit translational lift, um, a helicopter flies better when it's, when it's flying into the, in a, in a, when you're hovering, you're very susceptible to, to weird things with the, with the rotor wash. But when you clear the water, rotor wash, it gets nice and smooth. And the, the, the nose will dip down, or dip up actually, and then you, you, you have to push the nose down and, and off you're flying. And it flies a lot like an airplane. Oh. Well, I was already a private pilot. So we're flying along and took some, took some rounds in the tail rotor, and the tail rotor went out. Oh, were you, by the way, did you have uh, troops on board? No, were you taking no, them? no. Okay. We, were, we, we just dropped them off okay. on an assault. Uh -huh. And so I had my, my, my uh, crew chief and gunner and me and the co-pilot and Peter pilot. I was an aircraft commander at the time. And off we go. And um, we hit translational lift. We're doing about 70 or 80 miles an hour at that point, uh, as opposed to the 120, which was, and we got hit, the tail rotor got hit. The guy didn't lead us enough. We didn't have no, no bullet holes up where we were, but back there there were. They, they hit. So it acts funny when that happens, but if you're flying fast, it streamlines because of the big, th th so it streamlines back there, but you have to be real careful with the darn thing. So if you're flying fast, it's no problem. You, can't, you can tell, but it's not a problem. The problem comes when you, when you land. What are you going to do when you land? Well, you have to land it like an airplane. You have to land very fast, and you control this by the torque. So you have to take the automatic uh, troop compensator thing. You have to uh, disc, you have to manually take it, turn it off, and now you can you can you can you, with the torque you can make the t airplane do this. And of course, you can go up and down. The engine's still running. I mean, so you have lift, but you have to so you have to control it with, and fly onto. And so I I declared an emergency, called up. Cameron Bay, they gave, they, do you want crash trucks? Sure. Do you need, do you need the, 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 do you need the uh, thing that's uh, foamed up? No, we don't need that. You know, and so the, the other guy's going crazy. Like, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> He's a senior pilot. So I know how to do this. So, okay, so I, I know how to do this. So we line up on a 14,000 foot runway that must have been must have been a quarter mile wide. I mean, this it's huge. It's B-52s land on this thing. It's huge. Uh -huh. 
and there's a little group of, of people waiting for us down there with their flashing lights and all that stuff and and you just line up and where are you gonna land on the on the center stripe okay so I landed on the center stripe and it stayed on the center stripe and I landed on the center stripe yeah. and so we all get out and the guys um, all give me a, a handshake and a pat on the back and uh, okay but but it's just business and you walked away I knew how to oh, easily yeah but I knew how to do that yeah. So that's that's yeah. that's two of them. Interesting part of that is that we had to stay on Cameron Bay at the Air Force Base that night mm -hmm. because in the middle of the night they didn't want to take us over there because because you might get ambushed on the way because it, it, once you left the perimeter you didn't know what was going to happen to you. So um, the next morning um, uh, I invited them out for breakfast and um, show up at uh, at the Ostrich Club it was the only thing open. It was a Sunday or something and um, and get in and have breakfast and as I'm leaving um, um, the air police show up and give me a little ticket um, and it's, I got I got written up <laughs> I got written up for being in the officers this club this was a joke wait a minute I got <laughs> written up for not being in the officers club not in dress uniform <laughs> on a Sunday <laughs> Oh okay, <laughs> oh so my. I go back. We get back home about three days later. Or three days later, I know it, it goes through channels, and the old man gets it, and he calls me, and he looks and I said, "Ro, what ha is, this, uh, is this? Is this what happened?" Yeah, and he goes, he wads it, wads it up, and throws it. Get out of here. <laughs> so okay, uh, they obviously <laughs> were not aware. Well, they were aware, but they're the Air Force. Oh my! <laughs> you know, goodness. I didn't follow their 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 cleanliness <laughs> rules or whatever. We oh all my. we all look like army guys that have just got out of an airplane. Yeah, we were. Oh my! <laughs> oh my! This is a, a little bit too much legalism here going on. Yeah. But uh, I, I am curious. From did you fly almost every day? Almost every day, I could. I was one of those guys that went down there, and I couldn't stand. If you didn't fly, you did other stuff. Mm -hmm. oh, I didn't want. You've heard enough stories. The other stuff sucks. Yeah. <laughs> Forget like, yeah, it. That or stay in your in your hooch and drink. I drank too much in Vietnam anyway, yeah. but I didn't want to do any more of that. Yeah. And I certainly didn't want uh, uh, guard duty. Pr well, I had a couple perimeter duties, which were kind of interesting. Um, but the uh, 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 so I slew. But flying, and I I know you're over there to fight the war, but flying could get you in trouble. But I mean, it may, it may get you killed? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> but you, you flew just about every day that you could. Thought I could. Uh-huh, yeah. Uh, I'm curious, did you ever get up and rub that <clears throat> uh, helicopter up and think, well, this could be the day? I mean, no. the, you never uh, no. had those? Uh -huh. If you think like that, you go a little crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And I... Well, I had a wife, a beautiful wife at home. I had a future mm -hmm. parents, and, and I was not, mm -hmm. I'm not going to die here. I'm going to go home. So, so I you did. really had a good mindset and confidence. Well, I was a good pilot. Yeah. I was a good pilot because I was scared shitless, yeah. pardon me, mm -hmm. that they were, I would yeah. do something. I would kill myself by not knowing how to do my job. Yeah. So I learned my job. If some bullet was going to catch me, okay, but it wasn't going to be my fault. I was going to be. <laughs> perfect at this yeah. and so I became a very good pilot mm -hmm. indeed uh, did you fly different types of helicopters over there no just the UH-1H uh -huh. no okay uh, so did you ever did you, now tell me you were sharing before the interview that you did fly troops from other countries Do you yes we were, we, were in, we were in direct support of the uh -huh. of the of the rocks we, we were Which the public, the, Koreans yes uh -huh. the Koreans and they're a different group. Can you explain that? Sure. <laughs> Flying in one day, um, we look over at their compound because we're, we're uh, right at the edge of their compound. They were in charge of our security, okay? And we Which we is took a good we, thing. We, we we took them. <laughs> it's a, it's a, yeah, the, the NVA did nothing to do with the rocks. The rocks cut their ears off and put them on a little string and carried them on the yeah you, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. The, this was good the vicious people fighting vicious people is fine. We'll watch. <laughs> so um, we uh, we're coming in one day and look over there and at their at their battalion compound, huge, big football here, and they're all out there. They're all out there and they're all out there. They're out there. They're up there doing a thing up, up, up here, 
and uh, what is that about? And, and I said, well, it, it, it's not, the band was playing. Well, it was, um, the um, two stories of the rocks, three stories of the rocks. Um, I, uh, they were out there because there was a guy that deserted. They caught him and in front of the battalion beheaded him. It was this a Korean? The, the Koreans. I mean, the Korean uh, was trying to, uh, going AWOL, or who was it? Was, was, was it one of their own? I'm not sure what uh, you're no, saying. Was it one of their own that was trying? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Not a, no, a yeah. Korean. Uh -huh. Right. A Korean. One right. Uh -huh. A Korean. Um, um, a couple months later, um, middle of the night, their lights go on, the, the music starts playing, the nice house. What the hell is going on down there? They're having a huge party. Then we find out that on guard duty, one of their officers came across a guard that was asleep at his post. Pulls out his pistol, blows his brains out. Everybody on post is getting up, puts in their dress uniform, walks. They walk through the, 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 the place where the guy was to look at his dead body, mm -hmm. and then, they, then they're released. Wow. They, they, they take this. war real seriously. Real seriously, even their translators were kind of afraid to talk to us. Yeah. I mean, they, it's, a, it's a war zone, and it, them, to them, it's a war zone. Do you know the history behind all that with them? Why they are the way they are? In their own the, the Orientals have a horrible history. We do too, but they held on to their, 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 honor system and their function they they must do as they're told they must conform to what they're uh, and there is no ifs or, or buts they will do it and and that's all the closest i can get uh -huh. um so um we're at a banquet for instance at one point um well that will we'll go yeah, there but go ahead no but uh, oh. so those are the two times there here here's how how crazy it gets um one of my missions, I wasn't air, the aircraft commander yet, um, we're picking up water, I don't know how big it is, it must hold 200, 250 gallons, big buckets. Um, I don't know what they hold in them, but, they, but we hook them onto the bottom of the airplane and fly them on a big long, you know, you've seen the kind of like, like airplane. So we're, we're doing those with, with taking the buckets back. I'm taking the bucket, we hit, we get clear air turbulence. The aircraft is going crazy and this way it's bouncing really hard. And um, um, I, I cut the, 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 there's a hydraulic, super sharp, uh, heavy duty cutter that cut the, cut the, the cable. The, the, the crew chief looks down, there's a Korean in it. So I kill this guy. Oh God! At the end of my career, what am I going to do now? And um, got to have to report it. And the guy next to me, I wasn't. A, 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 I said, said, number one, he said, I'm in charge of the aircraft, so they'll get me, even though you did it. And second is, we didn't do anything. What do you mean? We didn't do anything. What do you mean? He <laughs> said, he was not supposed to be in that bucket. They are not going to report it. If we report, if we that. report it. Somewhere up on high, they'll tell us to shut up, and they yeah. and they'll throw the paperwork away, because it makes them look bad. Yeah. What we did is we we executed one of their deserters for them. So oh so nobody's going to say a word. Oh. You're never going to hear about this again. It didn't happen. Yeah. It's just oh. right out of the movie Mash. No what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Those are <some laughs> stories. And then uh, you mentioned uh, being with the Aus the Australians too, but yeah. you said people. You said I just we just bumped into them once in a while. We didn't support them. Uh -huh. But you you said that they came from all over the world to support. Were they like mercenaries, or you said maybe Who? CIA? Who? What are you talking about? No, you said. Oh, well, one of the missions I had. Yeah. Those weren't Australian. Who knows what they were? One of my strange missions was a, uh -huh. a black helicopter. We go, they give us a helicopter, it's completely, all the designs are gone and it's painted black. Mm -hmm. It's a nice helicopter. Um, and we're told to pick it up there, pre-flight it, take it over there at the end of the runway where there's no buildings around and, and wait. And that's it. That's all they told us. And they picked me, who knows why they picked me, <laughs> to do that. 
So okay, we're done there. So we're sitting there, and we look over at the edge of the jungle, and out walks a black guy, a yellow guy, a brown guy, like like, and a couple of white guys in Eastern European fighting uniforms. Some of our fighting uniforms, Russian uniforms, some NVA uni uniform parts, and oh. different stuff, and weapons of the world. They got. German weapons, they got Russian weapons, they got our weapons, they got Korean weapons, they got who knows, it just, uh -huh. I was fast, I wanted to look at the weapons because I like weapons. Yeah. And they show up, they pile in the back, a guy hands me a note. And, <laughs> and on the note it says, um, take us to this location. I looked at the location and I knew the location and I looked at my maps and he said, there, 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 there. I'm not leaving and t uh, they were, we were told they're not going to talk to us, mm -hmm. and they handed us a note. And I said, I'm not leaving unless I know I can get gas to get back. Mm -hmm. And he said, keep going. I said, no. I said, it's my airplane, and I'll take you wherever you want to go, boys, but I know how to know I can get back. And as far as I know, I can't fly there and get back on one tank of gas. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think t and then he, s he pointed at a place and said, in perfect English to me, you can guess they get gas there. Okay. Was and so off we, and off we take, and off we take, yeah. we get to the spot, mm -hmm. we land, and they disappear. Did anybody ever go get them? I don't know. It wasn't my business. Uh, did this happen on occasion? I understand it did on occasion, but then again, um, why not? Uh -huh. it's, a, it's a war. Yeah. Um, they, they were, in my estimation, they were on a kill mission. They, uh, obviously they, on our side. Uh, obviously. They're obviously on our side. <laughs> and th those were uh, black American, uh, Hispanic American, uh, uh, Oriental American, whatever, um, uh, jump in with those things. And uh, their, their job was probably to capture somebody uh, or kill somebody um, in a particular area. And um, they had a, a way of contacting their hires. My bet is it's a CIA, a CIA-led mission mm -hmm. of some sort because uh, I don't, I'm not familiar with us doing that. I've known some special forces guy that were on kill missions, but they were in American uniforms with sni sniper scopes along the along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. This was near the Ho Chi Minh Trail, but these guys look in excellent shape, and they were going to do whatever they were going to do. Uh, and that was none of my business, ma'am. I just let yeah, them off. I know you <laughs> talked to them, but reflecting back, why why the different uniforms? I was told, and we were told to leave our IDs and couldn't take our our our, our dog tags. Okay, we're still in regular uniforms. Okay, we couldn't take our dog tags, our IDs, no wallets, and and I'm sure they were the same thing. It was so that they couldn't ID us and and prove we were there. It seems kind of juvenile, yeah. and I'm just a lieutenant, and I don't understand these things. But yeah. we're in a war. Yeah. Of course, we're going to be out there doing that. They're doing that to us. Yeah. But maybe the maybe politically we weren't supposed to be doing that. Uh -huh. We weren't supposed to be doing operations in Laos either. Right. And I've never seen Laos, <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. only on a couple of times. <laughs> got shot at, and if you got, uh, got shot down out there, they, they, they rushed and picked you up, picked everything up and got you out of the place so that it never happened. You know, I have a question about that. Uh, are you familiar with the special operation group SOGS? Some. Just by name, and, and oh. I've read some books, but... Not being, uh, you never worked with them, fought with them then, uh, had any uh, not, not, them. not officially. Oh. I don't know what that group was. Maybe that was a SOG. Uh -huh. I don't know. Yeah, just, you know, just mm. talking about that. Uh, now, you were over there 72, what, what year were you there? 72, 73. And 73. I was in, in, <laughs> I was <laughs> in the officer's club getting drunk. When Richard Nixon got on and announced that we'd won the war in Vietnam and we're coming home, he at, you actually heard him say that? It, yes, didn't you? You've never heard that? That we won the war. I don't remember. Oh, he. That. It was a, 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 about this. About it was flowery speech, and da 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 da. da and um, I'm declaring the war is over. We've won, and I'm bringing the boys home. Something like that. You've never heard that speech? I I literally. Did not hear him say we won. We won, yeah. Because that would be incredible for him to say that. Well, it was a political way out. We won. Right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the officer, every American I know, got drunk. If the NVA wanted to kill us all, it would have been that night. Yeah. We were incapable of doing anything. 
we were we won. Of course, we all got shot at that day, probably, um, and you know, there was that kind of stuff. They got mortared regularly, but. Well, see, you were there in an interesting part of the war winding yes, down. Yes, yes. And I need to ask you about the morale while you were there of the American troops. Don't be the last guy to die in Vietnam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, and clearly the big boys were doing something strange because up by Pleiku, mm -hmm. there was a, a large valley, a large valley that that we were forbidden for flying in for any reason. You fly by the front of it and look up it and there'd be a haze in there from the smoke. At night you could see fires. That's where they were living in there. There was some sort of an arrangement, in my opinion, between the North and Viet, the North, the South, and, well they meant the South, but the North and, and us, that they're not gonna screw with us and we're not gonna screw with them. So there were no big operations at that point against US bases. We were leaving, mm -hmm. at, the, at, at the end of my tour, we were leaving, mm -hmm. clearly, mm -hmm. and um, they didn't mess with us and we didn't mess with them. Okay, up until your last mission, by the way, how many missions did, did you do a count on your missions? How many you did? No. Hund obviously hundreds. 150 to 200 probably. Yeah, it's, yeah fair amount. Yeah. A mm -hmm. lot. Mm -hmm. You're here. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. But uh, up to your last mission, did you feel like you were making a... Eh, how do I ask the question? Were you... St was everybody still fighting? Fighting the war up until your last mission? Maybe you already answered it. The, d the last day you went out, uh, you were engaging the enemy. The last combat mission? Yeah. Um, um, I don't recall it. Mm -hmm. I can I can sort of place it in my mind, mm -hmm. but um, um, what was the? Well, I can I, I've I'm got sorry. it in my mind. What was the yeah. question? Well, the question mm -hmm. is, uh, uh, were you actually like at the beginning? You were doing the same thing at the end of your tour, knowing <laughs> knowing things are winding down. Just a whole different mindset, right? A whole different beginning. mindset. Yeah, yeah sure. is a. Uh, is then you become everybody becomes a really good pilot. Nobody wants to be the last guy to die yeah, in Vietnam. You, you said that, yeah. <laughs> and um, the uh, what a way to try to fight until the end. Well, well, yeah, but but it happens just like that politically. We were there politically, and we left politically. Mm -hmm. um, um, he declared that, and then within a couple of days, we were not to fly any more combat missions. Okay. And they stood our they stood stand down. They they stood our unit down, mm -hmm. and we had to get we had to uh, turn in everything and get rid of everything and get weird? processed just just like that just like that. The Koreans actually took the runway. It was a called per perforated steel planking PSP. Yeah. They actually took it apart and <laughs> took it home, dismantled the we took it home. We gave them we gave them oh all of our all of everything. They got our M16s, our vests, our they really? got every oh yes yeah, they they took every well it was a thank you they took our vehicles they didn't they took took is the wrong word we gave them yeah. and they accepted everything we, we we could we didn't want because um, they couldn't bring everything home so um, if you had a, a truck that um, you did, that was old and dilapidated what did you do with it a Chinook came over picked it up took it out over the South China Sea and dropped it. So wow. we were, we were everything that the, the the North Vietnamese could use, we put into the ocean. Really. Really, the South Vietnamese Vietnamese got everything they could get, the good stuff, the really good stuff, um, and then we the, the rest. Okay. Now now and that includes helicopters, you know. Really. We we just oh. we had all this stuff there, yeah. and then we're leaving. Well, some of it you don't want to take home. You want to take the new stuff or the good stuff home, but some. Why would you? Why would you take that stuff home? What are you going to do with it? Put it in a pile and burn it, or dump it off in the South China Sea? Mm. Did they? You know, I never even thought about this. Did they literally leave the very same time the Koreans that you left, that the Americans left? Did they linger on for a while, or they just left before or at the same? They time? They left just before us. Right before. The 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 rock. Yeah, the White Horse and the and the. 
You know, and I guess I've never asked this question. How do they feel about all this? Who are they? The Koreans? The Koreans. Oh, how would I know? Yeah. I was a lieutenant. Yeah. I think they're... Um, they're a, um, gung ho is what we call in, in the They were much more gung ho than us. Right. I mean, um, they probably missed it. It was a war. That's what they do. They love it. Kind of like if, if, you're in, if you're in the, uh, if you're if you're a full time military guy, yeah. but they had conscripts in there too, you know, yeah. and guys that didn't really want to be there, and so they were glad to go home and have wives and kids and yeah. carry on with their lives too. Yeah, yeah. And what was uh, were they considered our allies? Is that the reason they joined the war? Oh, I don't. You're asking me political, yeah. geopolitical questions from yeah. 50 years ago. I don't know. Yeah, and the Aussies were there. Why did the Aussies go? Yeah, I guess because we're, uh, you know, they've always been partners in wars with America. The, the Korean South Koreans gave us two divisions, yeah. mm -hmm. and they did a great job. Yeah. Um, and okay. And okay. They, and they, you know, so we're, we're in their country. Yeah. Okay, then, Tom, uh, how much long... Okay, so getting back to the end of the time you were there, sure. what was going on? Were you at the tail end, or were there still folks cleaning the place up, moving out after you? Oh, I wasn't there at the very end. You were. I was not at there. I was not there at the very end. What are you talking about? No, the very no, end. No, I'm just saying. Were you literally there at the end, or were there those after you getting things ready to go home? I don't know what the end means. I was not in the compound in in Saigon when they extracted the last people. That would have been seventy-five. I, yeah, I, that was way after me. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyway. But, but but when uh -huh. you close down a war, you start closing down a war. You bring in your 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 outer bases. You close them down, and we close them down. Yeah. Then you bring it out to the bigger bases, and then they they somebody yeah. says, okay, close that one down, that one down, and we were one of those. Okay. So that we were closing down everything. Even the control tower left, everything's dismantled, and you and you burn what's left that the South Vietnamese don't want. Okay, you're, you're boarding the plane to go home. Yeah. Okay, and you're saying, you're saying, <laughs> what? What was that about, or what were you saying? Holy shit. <laughs> I made, it. I made it. I made it. And, and it, uh, now what? Yeah. You know, now what? I, I was going to the Big Red one in Kansas. Yeah. I knew that. I had to look it up. Where is that in Kansas? Mm -hmm. um, back then, you couldn't talk to your wife. I mean, they, they didn't have cell phones and and that and computers. That you know, right. <laughs> it was impossible right. to get a hold of anybody. Right. Um, um, I would sent her a letter saying I'm being reassigned and I I'll be home somewhere in. I think the month was February. I'll be home somewhere in February. You you lasted the full year. You completed your I'll, full year. Actually, it was a, a ten months. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ten months. Mm -hmm. And and uh, mm -hmm. they uh, okay. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you get on board the airplane and it's it's quiet. I bet. It's quiet. We all screamed and cl and when it touched ground. Mm -hmm. I was one of those idiots, of course, that got out and I fell on my knees and kissed the ground. Yes. So where, where did you I'm, land? I'm back. What, what do you, you know? Where what did you land? Um, um, was it to, California? It's, it's in Southern California. Okay. Uh -huh. No incidents. No incidents when you arrive at the air, at the airbase or at the airport. No name calling. Nothing like that. Well, uh, um, th that um, well, we landed. I can't remember the name of the Air Force Base. Was right across a big thing from from the civilian base. Not El Toro March. No, okay. uh, but, but and uh -huh. so it was crawling with people coming back from Vietnam, West just West. crawling. Mm -hmm. So I, I think they pretty much leave you alone when it's that. It's almost like an army base. There's so many people coming back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, there was probably a, a plane load every two hours. A plane load of three hundred. Really? A plane load of three hundred. There were hundreds of thousands of us over there. Yeah. Um, wow. So, so th we were everywhere. Yeah. So they, we processed. We got off, got processed, um, which was interesting. Um, they were they were letting people go out of the service as fast as they could. Mm -hmm. So when we landed, there was a big long thing. To check your check your uh, your stuff. Guys were bringing home AK-47s and stuff. They never checked me. Mm -hmm. I'd love to bring them, yeah. but because <laughs> I carried one to Vietnam on my back of my my. Instead of a M16, I carried a, a nice AK-47. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the uh, 
the, 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 the your process in. And if you wanted out of the army, it didn't matter who you were, what your rank was, how long you had to go. You walked over to that table, and they signed you out and paid you, and you left as a civilian. Really? Really. And hundreds of guys were doing that. The army was too big. At the end of a war, the army is too big. Right. And so why go through the expense of yeah. sending off and all that stuff when right then and there they can get rid of people? And so they what did you do? I went to the Big Red One in oh, Kansas. Oh, you said that, yeah. Yeah. Did you, uh, okay, where was your wife? Did she get to come and meet you? Or? Oh, no, I flew to Spokane. Okay, uh-huh. In fact, when I boarded the civilian airplane to go to Spokane, um, I had my, I was a, a young man with a spiffy uniform on my, mm -hmm. on my stuff. Shiny boots. <laughs> at, 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 uh, well, we were in tropical TWs. They didn't have boots on. Mm -hmm. uh, I was as an officer. I had shiny black shoes and a mm -hmm. tropical weight uniform and all that. It was the uniform of the time. They don't even have them now. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm getting on the airport and plane, and, and, the air, and the, it happens that the pilot was a retired Air Force guy, and um, there was an extra seat in, in first class. And so I'm sitting back, back there where I paid for my stuff, and the stewardess comes back and says, compliments of the, right. of the, the you've been promoted to yeah. first class. Yeah. And I went up there, huge seat, great right. food. Well deserved. And, and so I thanked the, thanked the guy and shook his hand. Well deserved. And then, then we, you know, you, then the sort of PTSD stuff starts. Because mm -hmm. th then when you're home and you step off the plane in Spokane and you look around, surreal yeah well you talk to guys too mm -hmm. it's undescribable mm -hmm. yeah very surreal i shouldn't be here yeah yeah guilt guilt yeah survivor guilt uh i don't you don't have to answer the question but did that go on for a long time um will you promise me to turn that off if i Absolutely. if i start crying yeah. <laughs> okay and you know Tom, so, so, Tom, so we have lots of tears in so it, it, we uh, do. Well, it's okay. But my family's going to see this. If it's okay with you, it's okay it's, with us. It's, it's <laughs> okay with me, but my family's going to see this. Okay. Um, some, it affected me um, with everybody. And um, I didn't belong here. Um, it's like a movie. I'm in the wrong place. Yeah. You've heard that before. Yeah. And then... Um, you have to sit down and get a hold of it and go, don't go crazy. <laughs> you, it's, it's over. That All that is over. You're now back in the Boy Scouts, mm -hmm. i.e. The, the regular army. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a movie that you saw and you participated in and now you're back. Mm -hmm. And I had to keep telling them, don't drink, don't drink a lot, Tom. Yeah. Um, just, just roll with the punches and I rolled as best I could. Mm -hmm. um, there were a couple incidences I could have handled better, but mm -hmm. it it goes away. Sure, it goes um, away, and then it pops up. It used to pop up once in a while. So sure. w everybody who's been shot at and been in a war has a little of that, and I had a little of that. I interviewed a Korean War veteran. He says you never really get over war. No, mm -hmm. why should you? Why do you? Why, you don't have to. That's right. I mean, but you have to put it in its place. Yeah. It was a war. Yeah. Well, very <coughs> very good. Very good thinking on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, stabilizes you. Well, uh, in the time that we have left, so you. How much time we got left? <laughs> how, how much time do we have left? About ten more minutes. Oh, <laughs> you kept me on Vietnam. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got out of Vietnam, but what is, what a story there. Uh, going then uh, into Kansas, then Fort uh, Fort uh, Big Red One. Fort Riley, Kansas. Fort Riley, Big Red One. How long were you there, and what did you do there? Uh, I was a, a platoon leader, and then a company XO, mm -hmm. and then a headquarters company XO. Mm -hmm. And how long were you there? I, um, you know, Year, 18 two months, two 18 months, something like that. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, did you know that you wanted to stay in the Army then? Well, it's I understood the Army. Mm -hmm. um, as you, as uh, we talked about, I retired as lieutenant colonel in the National Guard. And um, once you get the hang of the damn thing, mm -hmm. it's just a job. <laughs> It's just a job. I can't believe they made me a lieutenant colonel. I do not have the attitude, but I could do things. I could do things. And men uh, followed me well, so I had a lot of command time. I commanded uh, the local National Guard unit twice, once for five years, then they threw the guy out, and I got back for two years. A company XO here locally, uh, Yakima, the commander of the dust-off unit in Spokane, the commander of the state's MP, 
division and I ended up being, um, what else did I, anyway, my command time in my 20 years, I had 12 or 13 years of command time. Okay. Wealth of experience. Okay. So yeah. they can't really throw me out and I wasn't one of the good old boys that stuck my nose up their butts in, in Olympia. Um, what are you going to do with Tom? Give him another unit. <laughs> so they give me another unit. Yeah. And then that when it comes time, I, they make him a major. Made me a major. Mm -hmm. Then at the end of that, they say, Look, you know, they got the lieutenant colonel board comes up. And I'm sure the other guys did well at parties and did well politically. Um, but they didn't have the time in that I had served. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. so I, was, yeah. I was one of those. Excellent. And uh, by the way, uh, when did you retire? What year? 92. 92. And in the meantime... By the way, uh, Vietnam, uh, Vietnam gave me a, a present uh -huh. um, uh, because of the rotor wash issue when, uh, and the insertions I did, uh -huh. I was exposed to Agent Orange. Uh -huh. Enough of it that I've got three of the things that they're, of the 12 uh -huh. that, they've, they're, uh -huh. that Agent Orange gives you, so I'm on a disability from the military because of the uh -huh. cancer and the rest of it that, I, that, they, that they gave me. Yeah. And so that's a present that yeah. I brought as well as my my uh, memento, it's a present that I bought, yeah. brought with me By all the, the way, time. Uh, quickly, uh, is there a story with this over here? Your the, the oh, we're the eight, eight ninety second assault helicopter company, the Stallions. Okay. And when oh. you when you processed out, oh. they gave you a, a hail and farewell and, oh, and give nice. you a stallion. Very nice. With a little plaque. Very nice. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, quickly, uh, did you take any R and R's in Vietnam? You know. <laughs> the, again, the damn war. Um, Nixon screwed it up. <laughs> I was going to go, and I picked Bangkok because it was so exotic and weird to, for a guy from Spokane, Washington. So I was going to go to Bangkok for, for two weeks. Um, Evie couldn't make it. She was in college, and you didn't get to pick the time. They told you just to right the head at a time. So if your wife was just absolutely free, she could meet you somewhere. She, my wife couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And then I was about to process for that, and they cut the war off and said, all, all leaves are canceled, you're going home. I'll well, take that's, that. That's your I'll take that. <laughs> that. That works, that yeah. works. Uh, absolutely. Now, uh, your wife's name is Evie? Evie. Evie. Yeah. And children? Two. Two? Monica, Would you name their names? Monica and Alexis. And Alexis. They're and both teachers. Great, wonderful. And uh, and you're going into 50 years of marriage yes. this year. That's fabulous. This in, yes. Yeah, fabulous. September 20th will be and 50 years. Is, that's fabulous. And Tom, you're now here in Walla Walla. What? Uh, you're here now in Walla Walla. Yes, I live here in Walla Walla. Been here. I don't know. Some over 35, under 40 years. Oh, that long? Yeah. In Walla Walla. Yeah. Oh. So what, what uh, outside of your uh, National Guard then, uh, uh, side hobbies, interests, volunteer work? I sh I'm a competitive shooter. I re really do that, but I'm not at my age with my medical stuff now. Uh -huh. I'm pretty, pretty good at that. Excellent. I'm kind of a type A personality, as you can tell. I don't know how many people talk like this. <laughs> but <laughs> um, I became a, a policeman, a uh, reserve policeman, which is no fully, fully done here, police uh -huh. academy and all that. I had some prob medical problems, and I couldn't do that anymore. Um, I was the uh, director of the, well, a whole bunch of stuff. Started off at the mental health center here on the crisis team, yeah. involuntary commitments, court Fabulous. stuff, and all that stuff. Um, and then I became the director of the mental health center for 13 years. Fabulous. Um, then I went off to the Tri Cities and started their crisis team. Mm -hmm. I was their first supervisor. Then some people here called me up and wanted me to come to the pen. So I finished up as a, at the penitentiary. I was the supervisor of their inpatient psychiatric unit at the oh penitentiary and retired from there about five years ago. What an and amazing career. Well, full life. That, when you're, when you, I got too much energy. Wow, so do my daughter. So do my daughters. Yeah. And the, did they teach here in Walla Walla? Uh, one's uh, in Milton Freewater, one's in, in Tri-Cities. Excellent. Just Excellent. down the road. We wanted to make sure to name your family. Uh, Vic? Do you, Vic, do you have any questions about his no. time in Vietnam? I'm fine. Yeah, okay. Well, wow. What a, what a whirlwind. Well, if you talk to aviators, they've got more stories. Yeah. One of the things that nobody's ever going to see this except my family <laughs> um, is, uh, you know, all of those war stories that you hear about Vietnam and um, the craziness you see on shows and all that, 
that all probably happened. It is a crazy place. No wonder Vietnam vets had such a weird experience. Now, I don't know about the Afghan boys, the guys in the sandbox, what, they, what happened to them. They had uh, uh, the IEDs and the, and, the, and the fighting they did was more standard. Mm -hmm. the, the IEDs aren't standard. Mm -hmm. But this craziness in Vietnam, the way Difficult. we were handled, the way the, the, our supervisors handled everything, was just crazy. Was, yeah. I mean, uh, it, it's things I won't talk about right yeah. now. But, but yeah. There's, yeah, there's, mm -hmm. boy, I tell you, there's, um, I, I did want to ask you, uh, is there anything uh, that I missed to ask you that you just wanted to add? By the way, uh, and I'm doing a little question here, <coughs> VFW, any organizations like that since you've been I'm home? a charter member of, of um, AMBETS. Excellent. Uh, and, and we picked uh, AMBETS post-111. Excellent. So it's uh, for Veterans Day. Don Shack and, and so I'm yeah. I'm in that. Excellent. But um, um, I don't wear Vietnam um, hats. I don't wear uh, camouflage clothing. I any uh, you Vietnam wall. You know, you see these guys walking around. Mm -hmm. They look like they came out of the jungle again. <laughs> and they're and they're with. I I I'm not. I don't. That's not healthy. Yeah. In my life, that's not healthy. And you leave the damn thing behind and you go on. And you know, the only thing from a different point of view, selfishly speaking, I, I, I think everybody loves to go up and say thank you, thank you, knowing that you've been there. Thank you know, you I, and, and most of us don't understand that. Yeah. We no, just, I, we were just young men, did our job, yeah. went off, came back, let's leave that alone, yeah. let's have kids and, and keep moving. Yeah. Um, so I think but the healthy it's so thing. Much of it, it's so much for us. Yes. Uh, it's selfishly for us to, to yeah. really mm -hmm. uh, tell you we just really appreciate you. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate my, my brothers, too. Yeah, um, of and the brothers before me who died, yes. the, the ones I saw die, yes. the ones that are dying now. Yes, um, I know that. And, and you know, uh, and there's an identity. Again, I'm being selfish, but see, I wouldn't be able to do these interviews and meet you guys if you didn't have those hats on. Because I go up and I say, oh, well. Anyway, I, I'm going on too long about myself here, but just to say about wearing yeah, that yeah. from a selfish point of view. I don't identify myself as a vet. I don't identify huh. myself as a, air, as a helicopter pilot, huh. as a retired military guy. Um, I'm not. Uh -huh. That was me. Yeah, that is not now me. Yeah, that's um, very, that's and you, very have, you have to move on. Very interesting take on all that. You don't hear that too often. Yeah. But uh, did I... Did oh I keep saying one last question and this will be it. How did your service and experiences affect your life? Oh, that's another hour. Yeah. Life is cheap. life is cheap. Yeah. Life is short. Yeah. Don't fuck around with it. Yeah. Get it done. Yeah. So I came back a different person. Yeah. Um, I I I needed to finish light school or excuse me grad school. Mm -hmm. I I. I called up every member of the the uh, the the department, and I went out to lunch with every. Me How often does that happen? Mm -hmm. They went out to lunch with me. The Lord was with me on that one, yeah. and I'd look them in the eye and told them, "This is what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. I'm supposed to get a degree in psych, and I'm supposed to go out and help people." Wow, that's great. And that's what great. I do now. Great, fantastic, mm -hmm. fantastic. Finale. So. So I think, unfortunately, I think my daughters got some of that, <laughs> and from their mother, yeah. and so they're they, they are also quite active and and did lean you say lean fortunately? Fortunately, yeah, oh yeah, and, and and they lean into life. You have to lean into life. Well, let's lean into life because it's too damn short. Yes, a wonderful way to end this interview. Well, Words thank you. of great wisdom, and I hope those who hear this get what you're saying. And anyway, Tom, it must wear on you. I'll be a counselor now. It must wear on you to hear all these things. No, because you were because you were there too. Yeah. Never. I, I must be weird because I never get enough of just hearing the stories and just honoring all of you, honoring you by doing this. So, you know, I see I get emotional. <laughs> yeah. Thank you again, Tom, very much.